Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Proencephalin, New Biomarker and Novel Window to Kidney Function, Emerging New Data uh, for Proencephalin in Clinical Populations. My name is Scott Mater, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for this Lab Roots webinar. This event will be sponsored by Sphingotech. Sphingotech is a biotechnology company with an innovative approach to developing biomarkers for diagnosis, prediction, and monitoring of acute medical conditions such as heart failure, acute kidney injury, and circulatory shock in order to support patient management and provide guidance for treatment strategies. Sphingotech also develops biomarkers for improved prediction of health risks including obesity, cardiovascular disease, and breast cancer in order to support prevention strategies. For more information, please visit Sphingotech.com. We have uh, a few important announcements before we begin. Uh, the webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button in the lower left-hand corner of the presentation window. Following the didactic portion of the program, we'll have a moderated discussion panel where we will uh, address attendee questions in the time remaining. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is complete, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's faculty. Dr. Alan Mazel is Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. He's the Director of the Coronary Care Unit and Heart Failure Program at the VA San Diego Healthcare System in La Jolla, California. He is considered a leading expert on cardiac biomarkers and has over 300 scientific publications to his name. He has led several groundbreaking multinational studies that have paved the way for integrating biomarkers clinically important as diagnostic tools. Dr. Maisel is considered to be one of the single greatest influences in establishing an improved standard for heart failure diagnosis with BNP testing worldwide. Dr. Oli Malander, a professor of internal medicine at Lund University and consultant at the Department of Internal Medicine, Skåne University Hospital, Malmo, Sweden. His research is focused on improvement of cardiovascular risk stratification and identification uh, of modifiable, not modifiable mechanisms behind diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The author of 372 original scientific publications and counting, Dr. Melander has been the recipient of several investigational excellence awards, including the Peter Slight Award by the European Society of Hypertension for his contributions to prediction and prevention of cardiovascular disease. This brings me to today's first speaker. Dr. Ravi Mehta is Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine's Division of Nephrology and Associate Chair of Clinical Research at the UCSD Department of Medicine, where he directs the clinical nephrology and dialysis programs. Dr. Mehta is considered an international authority in acute kidney injury and has been integral to a more refined understanding of the disease, its many complexities, and evidence-based management strategies. I will now turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Mehta for his presentation, The Need for Novel Biomarkers in Renal Disease. Dr. Mehta. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I will uh, try and uh, put a profile of the ensuing discussion on biomarkers, by just simply laying out what uh, we currently know and where we need to go. Uh, these are my um, uh, disclosures uh, for my uh, for this presentation I'm going to cover this topic in three broad areas uh, give you a broad overview of AKI acute kidney injury epidemiology describe what we might need in the field and then uh, discuss the challenges and opportunities that we have 
Uh, to put this first aspect in perspective, when we look at the global burden of, of kidney uh, disease, you can see here is that approximately in the United States, we are currently spending about $9 billion a year for acute kidney injury management. 300,000 people die from it annually, and the length of stay increases considerably, and the overall death rate per year is greater than the combined death rates of prostate cancer, breast cancer, heart failure, and diabetes, and the odds of death increases quite significantly. When we go into uh, a broader perspective and look at the burden across the world, you can see that uh, in the high-income countries, as you go from an episode of acute kidney injury, you can have a significantly high mortality of about 10 to 15 percent, and then consequently develop chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And when that translates to low- and middle-income countries, you can see the magnitude of that burden is considerable. We, our knowledge base in epidemiology has been derived from multiple different sources and has been enabled largely by the development of the diagnostic and, and uh, staging criteria, which I will show you in just a moment. In addition, we have information on the hospital settings and community settings and different disease states in timed insults and where it occurs. This has been enabled to a large extent over the last uh, almost uh, 14 year or 12 years by the introduction of the rifle staging, the akin classification, and most recently the KDGO classification for acute kidney injury, which are largely based upon two primary criteria itself, and that is a change in creatinine and or a change in urine output. This change in creatinine is measured over a course of seven days, and the staging criteria just reflects the magnitude of change, either as an absolute criteria of about 0.3 milligrams per deciliter or 26 micromoles per liter within a 48-hour interval, or a change of between 50 to 100 percent rise from a baseline within seven days. And this staging criteria have been validated in over a million patients in multiple publications. In fact, these staging criteria in a publication we made in the Lancet last year demonstrated that across the world there is a significant burden of acute kidney injury. As you can see, in even remote parts of Africa, you have almost a 23% incidence of acute kidney injury from the literature. What this has reflected in essentially is this, this finding that you have a difference in the high-income countries and low-income countries, but the manifestation overall is quite similar. Regardless of how you get there, a change in functional status is what represents the change, the, our ability to diagnose the disease. And you can see from the right hand and the left hand panels here, the changes in the low income and middle income contrasted with the high income countries overall. What's important to recognize though is that to a large extent, we are contributing to some of the burden of acute kidney injury by the diagnostic and therapeutic interventions that we need to employ to take care of these patients. As you can see in this middle channel, uh, middle panel uh, uh, column here, there are significant uh, relationships to all the most common drugs that we commonly use and association with different procedures. One of the key problems that we face, obviously, is what happens after an episode of acute kidney injury. And this cartoon shows you possible scenarios where you have either full recovery, development of chronic kidney disease, or if you had pre-existing chronic kidney disease beforehand, you would have a decline further or you end up on end-stage renal disease. And what is now well recognized is that if you have chronic kidney disease, it is a major risk factor for acute kidney injury. And if there is a further decline and a rapid progression with every episode of acute kidney injury so that you can hasten the, the, the development of end-stage renal disease. So in this background, then one comes to the question is what's needed? And I think the first aspect here is that if you have to, if you look at a patient, you need to determine if kidney damage has occurred and what is its current status. The second is to define the nature of injury and do we need to intervene. 
and then thirdly is to ascertain prognosis and define the follow-up. Now, what tools do we have? Currently, in this conceptual framework, as you see, the decline in GFR, which is the diagnostic criteria which we currently employ, is where we detect kidney injury or we say somebody has a problem. But what we really need to do is to look further to the left of this and see where damage is occurring and also the patients are at increased risk to be able to identify them. So consequently, I take you back to the, to the diagnostic criteria. You can see that the criteria are still based largely on a change in creatinine or a change in urine output. Now, what that translates into is then you need to know what was the reference creatinine against which you are going to demonstrate a change overall. And when we look at epidemiological studies, to a large extent, we may not have that information in a large number of patients. As shown as this, in this right circles here, you can see that only about 30 to 40 percent of patients may have a reference creatinine prior to admission. And this cartoon here demonstrates a typical patient. So as you can see in the red dots and the red line, this is representative of a change in renal function with a decline. And as you can see, if you have a decline in renal function, the detection by serum creatinine occurs a little while later than the actual decline because it is reflective of the accumulation of the creatinine. So you are always lagging behind the actual change itself. And if you take drug-induced renal injury as an example, you can also see that the biomarker levels may reflect three different, different general courses. An acute event with an up and down, a more subacute event, and then more chronic toxicity, which may reflect different drugs, which I will come to in a moment. And one of the key challenges we face in this area is that we know that there are precise definitions of a of chronic kidney disease which require a duration of about 90 days. An acute kidney injury, as I mentioned to you, requires about seven days. So that leaves this large segment in between of acute kidney disease, which is in between these two episodes. And this is something that we still haven't had a good, uh, uh, a good handle on. These are the classification and staging of chronic kidney disease. And the reason I show you this is to reflect again on the fact that a significant number, almost about 35% of patients who come with acute kidney injury will have underlying chronic kidney disease overall. So we have four areas for the challenges and opportunities that we need to think about. First is the time course and exposure. We know that biological processes will always precede a symptomatic phase. And you can see here in this cartoon that even in the setting of a genetic predisposition, there's a biochemical phase which may precede the functional impairment or be concurrent with it. And the amount of damage, cell death, and repair will dictate to a large extent how we detect it overall. But we have the tools now to detect this both in the urine and in the blood depending upon what we are looking at. But as shown in this cartoon here, it depends upon the, the, the efficacy of a particular biomarker and the specificity of where it will rise and also what its trajectory will be. So you can see that depending upon when you measure it, you may catch a biomarker at its peak or at its decline. So knowledge of the time sequence of a biomarker therefore becomes very important. As is illustrated in this slide here, we have patients with cardiac surgery and if you measure a sequence of different biomarkers here and recognize here that NGAL and KIM1 are reflective of damage and cystatin C and creatinine are reflective of change in function, you can see that the trajectories on this, here's creatinine in the purple, here's cystatin C in the green, here is the NGAL in the red and KIM1 in the blue, their trajectories are quite different when you measure them. And therefore, one of the key things here is timing after renal insult as to when you apply a biomarker. And as I've shown you before, the creatinine takes a little longer to rise, so an earlier time point of detection would reflect of some opportunity that you may be able to intervene earlier. A second aspect therefore then becomes is, can you detect subclinical injury? 
And what this cartoon is demonstrating here is that if you were able to use a biomarker to detect the early phase before creatinine has risen, this gives you an opportunity to know if damage has occurred or not and what the relationship is. So a few years ago, we had an ATKI consensus conference and we came up with this, with this uh, matrix. If you were to use a functional and a damage marker together, you might be able then to classify patients into one of these four boxes at any given time point. Either they have only a damage marker elevated, such as KIM-1 or NGAL, or you have a functional marker, such as cystatin C or creatinine or urine output, or a combination of both or none. And therefore, this would class classify them into different categories. And one of the more important aspects then becomes is this would allow us to change our current definitions from just reflecting on GFR and damage to have a collective and expand this so that you could have either GFR or GFR and damage or damage alone. We currently are not there because we don't know what are the thresholds for the biomarkers to detect damage and to be able to validate it in large studies. There is some evidence that there is, met, met, there is some, uh, some value to this. In this large study in the cardiology field, if you looked at N-gal and serum creatinine alone in this first panel here, you find that incidence of events when both are negative is relatively low. If you have N-gal positive and the creatinine negative, the, in the, the incidence of events goes up. If the N-gal is negative, that means there's no damage, the creatinine is still positive, suggested more of a functional state or a pre-renal state. It is an intermediate effect, and if both are positive, you have the worst effect. What this also amplifies to a large extent, then, is this thought process that people are, this is a dynamic change. You want to be able to see, as people move from one box to the other, because that helps you guide therapeutic intervention and also further diagnostic strategies to demonstrate that resolution is occurring or not in that setting. Now, we have a variety of different biomarkers which are also site-specific. And these site-specific biomarkers then, then can, can tell you the site of injury, can also help us map the pathways of injury. The difficulty is obviously recognizing how these all interact with each other and the availability of these biomarkers for regular use. But in functional terms and pragmatic terms, what we really want to be able to see is, is there a distinction between a biomarker which is elevated in somebody who had, was otherwise healthy versus someone who had underlying chronic kidney disease, and therefore a combination of both a damage and a functional marker may be of great value in this setting. And this slide exemplifies, to a large extent, what happens if you have underlying chronic kidney disease. At the bottom here, you can see that you have two, two time points, a GFR, patients with GFR less than 60, GFR greater than 60. And in each panel, you have immediate post carotid bypass, three hours, 18 hours, and 24 hours. And this is urinary NGAL as an example. And what you can see here is that the presence of an underlying renal disease has some elevation on the underlying biomarker at baseline. So these people, regardless of an insult, will have a higher level itself. So there needs to be take some element of caution in terms of interpreting these overall. And what you can see here is, based upon the severity and outcomes of this, these biomarkers, you can establish some cutoffs. So for example, for your NGAL, less than 104 or greater than 104 may have some prediction, but these values will change depending upon what the population is overall. In the United States, we have now a, the only uh, biomarker which is currently approved is, is a combination of uh, uh, TIMP2 and IGF uh, uh, insulin growth factor binding protein 7. This is in currently being utilized uh, overall in, in this, uh, in this uh, setting, and, and we hope that this will be something that will become into more use overall. Now, the other aspect here is comorbidity is heterogeneity of AKI, and in this uh, slide, all I'd like you to focus on is uh, panel A and panel B. In panel A, you can see that decreased kidney perfusion reflecting, say, a pre-renal state is in the, in the pink, uh, uh, 
pink line. When you look at a patient who is healthy with no AKI versus on the other extreme, somebody with ATN in the black line, depending upon the heterogeneity of what is happening, you have an influence on the specificity and the area under the curve of any biomarker. So the, the, the proportion of how much there is a functional change versus damage will influence the ability of a specific biomarkers in identifying this process. The second part is the heterogeneity of etiology. If you look at patients with ischemia reperfusion versus sepsis, the sepsis in the purple line, ischemia reperfusion in the blue line, the trajectory and the peaks might be quite different in terms of the thresholds where this may be established. And then when you look at the heterogeneity of background function with normal versus low GFR, obviously, as I've shown you earlier, the thresholds may vary in that time frame itself. So my last part here is essentially the specificity of a chronic drug-induced injury. And one of the key things which happens here is obviously looking at chronic toxicity. And as an example for this, when you look at, say, tenofovir, tenofovir we know very specifically is where it is handled by the, country, by the kidney, both with respect to the oat transporters and then also in the MRP to gene transmutation. And what we know here is that the concentration of uh, tenofovir in the mitochondria can cause mitochondrial dysfunction and therefore over time lead to an acutely uh, subacute injury which progresses to chronic kidney disease in that, in that setting. And therefore, there is now data obviously to suggest that if you had biomarkers which showed you the projection from one disease to the other and you correlate with biopsies, you may be able to predict patients who have these likelihood of these diseases. This cartoon just reflects again to some extent the different biomarkers where they are, what they can do, and how we might be able to utilize them, not only for detecting acute kidney injury, but also looking at the transitions overall. To just, therefore, to summarize, I think one of the biggest areas where the opportunities are is to think about these biomarkers as a fit for purpose. Now, this is the context where the FDA and regulatory bodies look at biomarker qualification and, and for, for release. And if you look at the context of use, these can be in these five categories overall. And this slide is taken from the FDA and the Biomarkers Consortium, where you can classify biomarkers in terms of identifying susceptibility and risk, diagnostic, monitoring, prognostic, predictive, or pharmacodynamic profiles. Now, it's quite evident by looking at this that it's unlikely a single biomarker will cover all of these aspects which brings me to the point that in order for us to use these biomarkers, we may need to think about them in terms of what their purpose is. Now, a particular biomarker may fulfill more than one purpose, but it just has to be demonstrated in terms of how that value is added to that change. But we are we are great opportunity there to look at these in these contexts itself. So my last slide, just to summarize what I hope I've shown you is that Certainly, we are at a very exciting time where we have a variety of different biomarkers with individual panels, thresholds, and we can use them for a variety of different aspects of clinical care. And also, however, to do this, we will need to marry clinical data with dynamic changes and obviously address the issues of availability, cost, ease of use, and specificity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi, for that important perspective on state-of-the-art care for renal disease and the unmet needs where biomarkers may play a role. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alan Maisel, who will be presenting on proencephalin and its role in acute kidney injury. Dr. Maisel? Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining today. I'm going to be talking on a novel biomarker, proencephalin, and its role in acute uh, kidney injury. Well, just to reiterate a small thing that uh, was said previously, that AKI is really a frequent complication that occurs in maybe one-third of everybody who comes into the ICU. And if you have septic shock, there's a 50% chance you're going to have AKI. And when this happens, the mortality may be up to 50%. 
So this is a huge problem. Now, I'm a cardiologist, um, and in, in, if you look at AMI versus AKI, you can see the progression and improvement of biomarkers we have had over the years for acute myocardial infarction. And yet, when we look at acute kidney injury, we really haven't had anything except a marker that you heard in the previous talk is not one really rising uh, quickly with injury. So what we really would like is a biomarker like a troponin, if you would, <clears throat> that you could measure in the urine or the serum that would really give you a early diagnosis for early management and perhaps development of new therapeutic strategies. So the five important considerations for renal function assessment, again, it should reflect the renal function. It should reflect re uh, real-time function rather than post-renal function like serum creatinine. And statistically, it should be validated for accuracy and precision in the clinical setting. You should be able to interpret the results easily in the clinical setting, and it should have clinical value. So here is just a chart showing uh, the ones that are out there, approved or, or uh, near approved. And basically, we don't yet have the ideal kidney marker. No other alternatives can satisfy everything we would want, especially, as was mentioned, is the serum creatinine. So let's now talk about proenkephalin. So proenkephalin first comes from enkephalin. Enkephalin we've known about for a long time, and it's a peptide hormone, you can see in the figures, that's really abundant uh, in the kidney, yet we, you cannot measure it. It is too unstable. It's processed uh, from the pro-hormone, pro-enkephalin, and there's a CNS-derived enkephalin, which we know as painkillers, and then there's this non-CNS, and this is the one that the heart and the kidney release. And these are ligands of two different opioid receptors that are highly abundant in the kidney. Now, proenkephalin, or as we also call it, PENKID, is a surrogate marker for enkephalin that has key advantages. It is inflammation independent, and it actually it indicates the actual need for kidney stimulation. So it's very active. Now, PENKID proenkephalin measures the stable component of its enkephalin precursor. It's a stable fragment. It's the 119 to 159 fragment of the proenkephalin. It's a surrogate marker for the release of what we'd like to measure in the past but could never measure it, the real enkephalin peptides. And, you, and now there's a measurement available that is suitable for clinical routine. Well, let's look at this slide here. PENKID strongly correlates to renal dysfunction. And in these two panels, first you see a very good correlation with creatinine. And in the second to the right, you see a very good inverse correlation with GFR. Now, if you look at proenkephalin and renal function in clinical populations, you could, there is definite renal specificity with the PENKID test. This is a general linearity model which shows the overall PENKID levels that are reflected with renal status. There is a tenfold difference in concordance with GFR versus other predictors of PENKID. And PENKID levels are actually highest upon ED presentation as a really solid reflection of the cardiorenal status. And the net reclassification index for PENKID, for those that were graded low risk yet had a MACE was 18.1. So this gives you information above and beyond what you could normally obtain. Here's some data to show the response of PENKID in relation to renal injury. On the left side, you can see that PENKID at the cut point of 100 picomole per liter will actually rise up to two days prior to creatinine when AKI is present or develops. In my field of conge acute congestive heart failure, this is very important and would lead me to a number of uh, things that I might do differently, such as diuretics, uh, ACE inhibitors, things like this. 
But even more important, perhaps, is that this marker can be used for monitoring AKI for the early recognition of kidney normalization. I can't tell you how many times in my acute heart failure patients, and one-third get AKI, that I have to keep them in the hospital sometimes for five or six days until the creatinine normalizes. Here, you can get a nice window several days before that, the pen kid drops, and they will likely be stable to send home, thus saving thousands of dollars in hospital causes. Well, let's now look at some studies of pen kid in acute kidney injury. Now, first of all, let's just put this on the table here, that there has already, you may be hearing this for the first time, but there is broad validation and it is growing. There is studies that in 18 countries, there's 23 clinical studies, almost 700 study centers, and over 25,000 patients have been studied already. So this is not a Johnny-come-lately biomarker. Let me start with one that we did at our own institution with cardiac surgery because we know this is a huge problem. We sent all my little residents and med students to, to the operating room early in the morning and about 100 patients uh, before, during, and after cardiac surgery, and we got samples and then looked uh, at who developed AKI in relationship to the biomarker pen kid. And again, you can see two different things here. First of all, in people that developed AKI post-operatively from a bypass, the pen kid was elevated within six hours of going on that pump. Secondly, you can see that before, uh, without the pen kit, it would take up to two days or more before you said, oh my God, the creatinine's up, they suffer a hit to the kidneys. I don't need to tell you how important uh, this can be. Well, let's look at some studies of critically ill patients now. <clears throat> let's start with a sepsis study that I was involved in <clears throat> taking place at my good, dear friend, Sal Soma and colleague at Sapienza University of Rome, who looked at 101 consecutive patients coming to his emergency department with sepsis and enrolled within 12 hours the AKI defined by the rifle criteria. So there's two things that we can see. In the left panel, you can see that PenKid increases with AKI severity but is in the normal range, zero and R, R for risk, in septic patients without AKI. Now that is because PenKid is independent from inflammation. Now you cannot say this like some of the other biomarkers, uh, NGAL, KIM-1, all responsive to inflammation, which can make it difficult to interpret in the septic state. And then on the right side, you can see that that admission level of pen kid can predict seven day mortality in these patients admitted with sepsis. Now, let me show you just a couple case studies to demonstrate how serial testing is important to window for renal function. I, as a biomarker guy, love serial testing. I don't wanna work with a biomarker that doesn't change in response to treatment or condition. And here it does. Patient one had high levels of pen kid the whole time there, above normal, died. Patient two had very high levels at admission, but with rigorous treatment, et cetera, the pen kid levels dropped in a normal range, that patient survived. Patient three started off with sepsis, but was fine, did not have high pen kid levels, but they developed during hospitalization, they died. And finally, Patient four, who also had sepsis, but never had any pen kid elevation, survived. What's more, in this next slide, we can look how serial testing can correlate to changing prognosis, and in this case, mortality. So here on the left side, you can see the baseline first test of pen kid done in the emergency room. And what they did then, they took a subgroup with a high levels of pen kit and measured it four days later. And what was found that if you did have a high level and it went low, you basically survived. 
Yet, if you hit a high level and it stayed high, there is a 50% chance you're going to die. I don't know about you. I want to know that information. What we would do about it, we're not sure yet. But there's hints, and those are targets that drug companies and other device companies may want to play into very quickly. Another way to look at this is a therapeutic goal. Right now, let's do whatever we can do to normalize pen kid levels in sepsis patients. And you can see here in this study, the green, those are alive over the hospitalization, and the gray shaded are dead. If you can normalize the pen kid levels, you do better, your survival is better. Now, what's normal? The studies have demonstrated this very easy to remember number of 100, 100 picomol per liter is a great target. Now, here's a study of renal dysfunction in surgical sepsis. Again, 42 consecutive ICU patients after major surgery who presented with clinical signs of sepsis. Renal dysfunction, yes or no. PenKid at a level of 100 was a very robust differentiator of renal dysfunction, early renal dysfunction in the setting of surgical sepsis. Now this is going to be, you're going to hear a lot about this new study, Frog ICU, th uh, several thousand patients uh, admitted to the ICU, both sepsis and non-sepsis. The data is just beginning to be published. But this is really a, a robust observational study on everybody who came to the ICU who required either mechanical ventilation for over one day or needed at least 24 hours of either vasopressors or inotropes. And you can see the demographics on the left side, but really on the right side, again, we see confirmation of AKI severity by the rifle criteria with PenKid at levels of 100 and above. The levels do not go up in just those at risk, so inflammation is not an issue. Otherwise, the more severe it is, the higher the pen kid levels. Let's look at another famous study, the pen kid in severe sepsis and septic shock and the famous Albumin Italian Outcome Sepsis Study, or the Albio study. This was a sub-study that, sho that had shows uh, uh, pen kid as a marker of renal dysfunction. It was a multi-center, randomized trial, open label, albumin versus crystalloid, and patients with severe septic or septic shock were enrolled at uh, 400 uh, centers. And here, again, you can see a robust correlation of with presence or absence of kidney injury and pen kid levels, but also the need for renal replacement therapy based on the levels. So if you get a high level, be prepared. This patient could be getting sicker and sicker, and any intervention you may be contemplating down the road, maybe we should consider early on. And then let's just take a look in my realm of cardiac disease and acute myocardial infarction. It's done by Dr. Eng and colleagues, demonstrating that PenKid as a kidney dysfunction biomarker can predict mortality and other complications actually in acute myocardial infarction. This can be extremely uh, important. And here we can look at long-term mortality uh, based on tertiles of pen kid levels. You could think of things that you might wanna do right away in this setting uh, in terms of how, you, how much contrast you give for cardiac catheterization, what renal drugs you might or might not use, and what kind of follow-up you would want for this patient. So finally, this is a, a figure similar, but a little different than Dr. Maida showed, on, uh, looking at PenKid as a real-time marker and the potential to augment the information we get from uh, just serum creatinine measurements. So on the left side, you see creatinine, not elevated or elevated, and up top, PenKid, not elevated or elevated. Start with the lower left box. No AKI risk. Your pen kid level is normal. Your serum creatinine is normal. You're probably good to go. What if your creatinine is elevated, but your pen kid is not? Well, this is likely a patient that already might have had some kidney injury, but is recuperating. 
You come in, they come into the hospital, they've been sick for a few days, and ah, kidney injury, but it's getting better. We may not even need to hospitalize this patient. Now the top right is someone clearly that comes in, or you see a high, high creatinine level, high pen K, boom, I think you have the diagnosis, acute kidney injury. And at the right, you have a high pen kid, but a negative creatinine. These are the ones I'm very interested in, especially my acute heart failure patients, for instance, because these are the ones I feel that are going to be at risk for acute kidney injury that we may be able to intervene in. So let me conclude about the growing evidence-based data that we have for proencephalin or PENKID. First, it's a reliable surrogate plasma marker for encephalin. It's been clinically validated in several thousand critically ill patients, both sepsis and in acute cardiac disease. It is not affected by systemic inflammation. And also other comorbidities that we see in real life, like age and sex and things like that. It's got a simple cutoff of 100 picomol per liter that's been validated in clinical settings. The clinical utility of PENKID, it can predict and diagnose AKI in the settings I showed you, sepsis, heart failure, and it can monitor acute kidney injury for early recognition of kidney normalization. And finally, as with any biomarker, you, you always look at the biomarker along with the clinical state. There is no substitute for hands-on history, physical examination, empathy, compassion for the patient. The biomarkers are added to approve that assessment. You don't use the biomarker by itself. You merge the science with the art of patient care. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Scott Nader. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we are um, beginning now to accrue a number of questions from our listeners. I want to um, reinforce that if you do have a question, that Q&A box is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, we will, um, uh, following the next presentation, we will have a panel discussion where we'll try to address your questions uh, in the uh, time remaining. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ole Melander from uh, Lund University Medical Center to present his work on proencephalin and the Malmo um, Health Study. Dr. Melander. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh, we're now going to move over to um, uh, from uh, mainly critically ill or severely ill patients to actually the population and healthy subjects. And um, I'm going to show you some data that proencephalin may actually be very good marker also at the population level to predict the onset, the future onset of kidney disease, of chronic kidney disease. And these data are based on a large population study from southern Sweden. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleague, uh, Christina Schulz, who's the first author of this paper that was published in Jason earlier this year. So I think I don't need to convince you that uh, chronic kidney disease is a, a growing um, public health threat. As you know, um, it's not only common, but it has been increasing over the past 20 years or so. And I think apart from uh, chronic kidney disease certainly being a very potent risk factor for going on to end-stage renal disease, we have to remember also that it's a very potent risk factor for uh, uh, developing cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality. So uh, approximately uh, 8 to 16 percent of the population do suffer from uh, chronic kidney disease. And uh, this in the early stages, just like hypertension, is not giving you any symptoms, so awareness is low. And uh, the, the etiology of chronic kidney disease is partially unknown, but uh, cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, and cluster metabolic abnormalities of the metabolic syndrome are clearly involved in the, in the, in, in the pathophysiology. And um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, being risk factor for cardiovascular disease incidence and mortality and as we previously heard, uh, uh, for uh, hospitalized, 
hospitalization and death once you get ill. So uh, looking at bio, measuring biomarkers in healthy subjects, but what is actually the clinical use of that? Well, I think uh, I, I'm very fond of primary prevention because when you are sick, it's usually too late to revert that. It's much more efficient to prevent becoming sick. So if, for example, if you are in the GFR, in the normal level of GFR, you should, uh, so there are several things in lifestyle that you can do to prevent development of chronic kidney disease. And again, don't remember that when you prevent chronic kidney disease, you will also thereby prevent cardiovascular disease. You may say that anyone should adapt a healthy lifestyle, but I think uh, those of you who, who are uh, act clinically active in primary prevention know that this is tricky business. So we do have a, uh, do have a great potential value of identifying the, let's say, hidden high-risk individuals in the population and putting even greater efforts from these people to adopt a healthy lifestyle uh, in order to prevent later onset of chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. When you move on to a, to a, to a, a slightly reduced level of GFR, uh, it may, if you can, maybe normally, if the blood pressure wouldn't be high, maybe you wouldn't go and treat that otherwise healthy subject with antihypertensive treatment. But if you have a risk marker, you may say that, well, this patient is, is at such high risk that we would actually like to go on and reduce that excess risk by treating the blood pressure at lower levels than you would otherwise do. And, um, and again, this is not only about preventing or saving your kidneys, it's also about preventing cardiovascular disease. So I would like to argue that if you can identify hidden high-risk individuals, even in this range of GFR, you could, that could actually be indication for lifelong statin therapy. And in, if you go to the, to when, when actually, uh, re, um, when uh, advanced uh, renal disease or uh, chronic kidney disease is established, we need also to have novel treatments. This we don't have yet, but this is part of the talk that we can use the early biomarkers to identify completely novel treatment targets. So um, on this slide, I'm just showing that um, chronic kidney disease, uh, as you probably know, has stages based on albuminuria and different levels of declining levels of estimated GFR. In this particular study that I will present, so we had a, the level defining chronic kidney disease at uh, less than 60 uh, milliliter per minute. Coming back to uh, encephaline, enke pro-encephaline, uh, Dr. Maisel gave you an excellent overview of why this um, um, uh, peptide is interesting in, in, uh, in relation to uh, renal damage and renal disease. And uh, uh, I have cited some of the studies that were previously mentioned in the, in, in the, in the critically ill patients post-MI, post or during sepsis or sepsis shock, that proencephaline is an excellent marker to predict acute kidney injury. It may seem, uh, from, a, from a physiological, pathophysiological point of view, a little bit um, a law, um, a far away to start and measure encephaline, but there is literature from quite a long time ago. This is a paper from uh, 1987 actually showing that in uremic patients, your uh, pro or sorry, your met encephaline uh, levels, the active uh, com compound in plasma, is vastly higher in uremic patients than in controls. Certainly, at that time, we think that this may this may only be a retention effect due to the loss of renal function, and again, this is why it's important to find out whether encephaline is actually causally related to renal disease or not, and I will come back to that in a minute. So the specific aims of this study was to study if there is a relationship between uh, fasting level of uh, proencephaline, again, in a healthy population, um, 
and uh, the risk of going on later to develop CKD or have a faster decline of your EGFR over time. And in the second part of the study, we wanted to test whether this is a parallel phenomenon related to filtration or something else, or whether it may actually be a causal relationship, meaning that a high level of proencephaline may be causally related to um, uh, chronic kidney disease. And for this, we used genetic methods that I will just briefly give you results on in, in the end. So this is, uh, uh, on this slide, you can see the clinical characteristics of the population study from southern Sweden that had a baseline examination uh, in the beginning of the 90s. And that's where, um, that's where uh, renal function was assessed along with other cardiovascular risk factors. And we followed these uh, subjects up for prediction of chronic kidney disease over a follow-up period of approximately 16 years and reassessed renal function at that stage. As you can see, this population is around um, 56 years on the average. And um, the pro levels, if you compare to the, to the previous presentations in the critical ill where the cutoff is 100 picomoles per liter, you can see as expected that these subjects are uh, considerably lower in the mean values of pro a little bit below 50 picomoles per liter. In, uh, at this next slide, uh, I'm presenting in, um, in the entire study population, which is about 4,600 subjects, the clinical characteristics at the baseline uh, examination back in the 90s in relation to being low, lowest tertile of proenkephaline, being in the mid-tertile or in the high tertile of proenkephaline. And as you can see, as you probably would expect, age is positively related. So the older you are, the higher are your levels of proenkephaline. But the next clinical characteristics are a little bit surprising, at least they were to us. If you look at body mass index, for example, so the higher your level of proenkephaline is, the lower will be your body mass index, the lower will be your waist circumference, your blood pressure, your glucose levels. So these metabolic features actually go in the opposite direction because if you listen to, uh, <clears throat> to all the previous data, you would definitely think that they would go higher with a dysmetabolic state. But for, uh, and again, these are the cross-sectional baseline data, with increasing proencephaline level, low, medium, high tertile, well, your serum creatinine, creatinine is definitely higher, cystatin C is higher, the estimated GFR is definitely lower. So that makes a lot of sense in relation to uh, the, the critically ill patients. Uh, on, the, on this slide, you, you will see the longitudinal change of EGFR in groups of uh, people who at the baseline had a low, medium, or high levels of proenkephalin. And here you can see, if you remember, the rather surprising relationship with metabolic traits so that the higher, are your, level, the higher your levels of proenkephalin is, the, uh, the lower will be the increase of waist circumference, and also uh, the lower will be the progression of your diastolic blood pressure. And same thing with glucose uh, decreases, but you, the, the decline of EGFR, if you look here, you see that clearly those people who have a high level of uh, proenkephaline at the baseline, over this follow-up period, they have a, a significant, those who have high levels of proenkephaline have a significantly greater fall or decline in their uh, estimated GFR during these 16 years of follow-up. 
Again, uh, if we then look at um, uh, the fasting level of proencephaline in, in relation to the risk of, in, in all, and of course at baseline these subjects were all free of chronic kidney disease, and the risk of going on to develop incident chronic kidney disease during the follow-up period. Uh, the risk of doing that, if you're in the top tertile of proencephaline at the baseline, you have a 50% increased risk, an odds ratio of 1.5, to go on and develop new onset chronic kidney disease, which is highly significant. It's highly significant in crude, in mildly adjusted, and in fully adjusted uh, models. And then uh, we need, of course, to, if we want to use a biomarker to identify, let's say, hidden high risk, we need to some way uh, also clinically evaluated. The one way of doing that is, uh, is, uh, is the, the area under the rock curve. Uh, this is a very poor way of doing it in long-term in, in long prediction. This is an excellent way in diagnosis and short-term prognosis, but not during 16 years of follow-up. Here you would rather like to have uh, to find hidden high-risk individuals, and this is what we can get the measure of by using the so-called net reclassification improvement. So when we added proencephaline on top of all the risk factors for CKD that we already know of, we could unmask about 40% of these people who went on to develop chronic kidney disease, as well as, uh, as um, also down-classifying people who were, falsely, uh, who were put at falsely high risk by the traditional risk factors. So this means that we can actually uh, identify, if you allow the expression, hidden high-risk individuals for CKD by measuring the fasting levels of proencephaline. In the next slide, um, we, we were encouraged uh, to, to, to look at uh, whether um, this is more important in the younger part of the population or the older part in population. And we actually found that there was a highly significant interaction between proencephalin level and the age of the subjects. And this means on, regarding the, the, the strength of the relationship on chronic kidney disease, as you can see here, the, the discriminatory value or the association between high proencephaline and, and uh, poor decline uh, or uh, rapid decline in GFR or high risk of CKD is much stronger in the young patients. In the older part of the population, this is um, uh, probably blunted by other age-related factors. So if you want to use proencephaline to predict chronic kidney disease, its, uh, its best use is in the more healthy and younger subset of the population. Finally, um, we were very interested to find out whether this is causal or not. This uh, means that we already know, as I showed you, this is just uh, expressed per standard deviation change, that fasting PENC is related to the independent risk factor of incident CKD. So we did a genetic screen, a genome-wide association studies. And don't get confused now. This is not saying that all that we are uh, finding here is genetics. No, genetics explains just a tiny proportion of proencephaline levels. But by identifying a genetic component of proencephaline, we can use that small but very, very significant uh, effect of, of, uh, pro of genetic proencephaline to study whether proencephaline levels are causally related to chronic kidney disease. So we identified uh, the strongest uh, uh, genetic factor in the gene of uh, proencephaline, and, uh, which elevated um, uh, proencephaline slightly, but very, very significantly. And then we tested whether this genetic elevation, which is not at all confounded by a lot of environmental factors that we have to deal with, with life, when measuring lifestyle factors or uh, uh, commonly also in, in, in uh, plasma biomarkers. 
And what we found was that the genetic elevation was actually significant. The genetic elevation of proencephaline was significantly related to the risk of chronic kidney disease. So this is a, a strong evidence that not only can we use proencephaline as a, as a predictor of chronic kidney disease, it's also likely to be causally related to chronic kidney disease because the, well, otherwise the genetic component wouldn't be related to disease incidence. So I'd like to conclude by uh, uh, saying that, uh, reminding that um, uh, we have now quite strong evidence also, apart from the critical ill, we know in the population that proencephalin predicts the onset of later chronic kidney disease later in life. So, uh, and we have shown that you can actually identify hidden high-risk individuals and you can do something about that because you can at an earlier stage go in and treat blood pressure. You can do an intensified lifestyle therapy and you may even consider statin therapy because of the, of the comorbidity later in life with cardiovascular disease. And... Um, in the last part, which is a little bit more for the future, I showed you that uh, the genetic approach showed that, pl that the plasma concentration of proencephalin is likely to be causally related to development of chronic kidney disease. And this is not only of academic interest, because what it suggests is that in the future we may be able, because of this causal evidence, we may be able to block uh, any uh, causal effects of proencephalin with new drugs and thereby maybe use these drugs in people who are sick, maybe and even the further in the future, to use as preventive medications. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for listening very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oli, and um, excellent presentations from all of our faculty presenters would like to uh, we, we are at the top of the hour and uh, we do have a few minutes where we can uh, entertain a few questions that have come in and I'd like to go ahead and move directly to that um, the um, uh, the questions that have come in um, the the first one I'd like to talk to the group about is um, a question that's regarding the uh, integrating this test into clinical practice, we've obviously seen a lot of emerging data that has come out. There is uh, a great deal of data that is underway with this product. But from the data that we've seen, uh, I'd like to turn it to our panel. Maybe, uh, Ravi, uh, as you have presented the, the need for biomarkers and you've uh, an acquaintance with the data that our faculty have presented on Pro and Keflin, do you have any thoughts on how this product might be um, integrated into clinical practice, um, you know, with the, with the information that we have? Uh, yes, Scott. I think that both Alan and Ole have presented uh, the application of uh, PenKid in clinical practice. And as you can see, uh, its value add, uh, to my mind, would be more in um, defining a change in renal function uh, prior to an elevation of creatinine. So in a sense, it is a functional marker, which is more more uh, precise and more uh, timely than creatinine currently. And what Alan pointed out was in his uh, four uh, matrix was essentially it might also reflect a resolution of kidney injury earlier than creatinine might reflect. And as always pointed out is if it is reflective of, of downstream changes, then it can be a risk profile marker which allows you to pay more attention to patients with this so I think in all in all, um, it, its application will need to be defined further as we go with uh, for the studies, but uh, with the results we have here and its, its uh, ability to discriminate despite the setting is a very, uh, uh, very important area. Thanks very much for that, uh, that comment. I think that captures things nicely. Maybe, uh, Alan, the, um, the comments that uh, Ravi mentioned about this being a functional marker, uh, the um, uh, the kinetics of, of its availability in blood and uh, its presence in blood in real time. How how do you see this um, uh, in uh, acute kidney? Well, I, I think um, first of all, you can if you're in Europe, you can obtain this right now. There's kits available. I think in the United States, there's still some development uh, left to do. 
I know there's some uh, very important labs that are uh, taking this on and studying this in the United States, and I hopefully one day soon they'll be available in either assays or point of care. Obviously, if you're dealing with AKI, you would like not to have to wait too long for that information, so the quicker you can get it, uh, the better you will be able to handle it. As a cardiologist, I very much can see this being of use in my acute heart failure patients. And when they come in the ER, determination of AKI, no AKI might tell me how, what kind of diuretics I'm going to use, whether I should withhold ACE inhibitors, whether if they need to go for angiography, should we try to delay the contrast or not. A whole host, including where I put the patient in the ICU versus the floor, certainly I'm not going to discharge somebody from the ED that has a heart failure and uh, impending uh, kidney injury as elicited by a high pen kid level. Do you view this as, um, you know, you've mentioned heart failure, your, your area of clinical focus, do you see this as part of a panel? I know you've developed biomarkers in that category. Well, yes, I, I do. And, uh, you know, we're hopeful with the NGAL, uh, it hasn't uh, quite uh, panned out for heart failure. But, um, yeah, we really need, besides an injury, the natriuretic peptide, one for infection, uh, fibrosis, biomarker, whatever, where there's a panel, but I would always include if we could, a marker, well, we always get creatinine, but something that would be elevated before creatinine. I think this will be, uh, you know, five years from now, this will be part of every workup for acute, uh, acute heart failure. Very good. Ollie, uh, any comments that you'd like to offer? I know your conclusions kind of, uh, your conclusion slide suggests some, some uh, place where this product meets clinical need. Do you care to expand or, or comment further? Right. I mean, I completely agree with Robin and Allen, and, 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 and I think that this, this is definitely um, uh, uh, ready for use in the critical ill and in these settings. And, um, but if you look at many other bar, I mean, take Allen's uh, old friend uh, BMP. I mean, we're using it now for risk prediction in the population. So what I presented probably will come a little bit later, but I'm pretty positive that it will come. I also think that for risk markers, I have learned that we, we will, I mean, for in the population especially, you don't want them to correlate with all the already known risk markers. PANKID is inversely correlated with all the, tradi with all the metabolic and traditional risk factors apart from renal function. So I think it's going to have a big value also at the population level for finding risk individuals. Very good. Thank you very much, panel. I'd like to ask another question that came in. Uh, it is related to um, the question about this, you know, obviously some of the data presented, the, the, um, the frog ICU study, uh, cell the Soma study, Alan, uh, the Malmo study in particular, these large studies in European soil. Uh, while there has been some U.S. stuff presented today, um, is there more data coming available um, on pen kid test in, in U.S. populations? And yeah, Alan, why don't I direct this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. I mean, already 25,000 patients have been studied, but I assure you, there are many, many data banks and studies that are being completed at this time um, using uh, pen kid as a diagnosis and a uh, risk predictor. You will see a number of very good, I feel, excellent papers. Uh, published probably within the next uh, six to 12 months. So the, 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 there's a treasure trove of data being mined currently uh, in the United States. Very good. Uh, the, um, and uh, and uh, Ravi, um, uh, I don't know if you have um, any, any thoughts or comments as a U.S. investigator and, uh, and clinician, but um, um, certainly this is an area of, of great exploratory. Do you have any areas with U.S. populations you'd, you'd like to see this? Well, um, I think that uh, I think one of the one of the areas which ties into all of this is essentially not only for diagnosing acute kidney injury, but uh, predominantly to look and see what happens in the recovery phase. Because if the connection from AKI to CKD is as uh, robust as we are finding it to be then finding a biomarker which not only predicts whether you are uh, at risk for or have developed it, but in terms of are you resolving from it or are you likely to get CKD becomes an important perspective in which to evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
Uh, thank you very much. You know, uh, one other comment uh, uh, I will uh, uh, make, and that is, you know, Ollie, I know your the Melmo study was listed in fasting uh, fasting uh, uh, plasma. Uh, that was that was part of the Melmo study and not not part of the requisites for uh, uh, pen kid testing, correct? Exactly. No, I, I don't. I mean, there are many biomarkers uh, related to metabolism, of course, that need to be taken in the fasting state. But, but for parenchymally, and that, that that's not a uh, that's not a criterion. It's it was just part of the design of the study, just like you said. Very good, very good. We are at uh, ten minutes past the hour. Um, I, uh, I I want to thank all of our attendees for staying with us. Uh, through to this point. I'd also uh, like to reference for those attendees who did have questions we haven't gotten to. Uh, we are able to address those um, uh, after the fact and uh, we, will, um, we will direct them to appropriate faculty and uh, respond uh, privately uh, as LabRoots does have your contact information directly. Uh, also, um, um, we are looking forward to having more information on this come available. I'd like to finally thank LabRoots and thank our faculty, uh, Drs. Mehta, Maisel, Melander, the three M's, uh, for your outstanding contributions to our better understanding of uh, proenkephalin. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation today, and we look forward to meeting with you again in the future at another LabRoots webinar. Thank you. <laughs>